Thanks, Janet, and welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, based on the number of attendees logging in here every second, uh, we can tell this is a pretty important topic to, to many in the industry, whether you're actively doing cash discounting and surcharging or just trying to figure out what, uh, what all the conversation's about. So that's, uh, that's our goal here today and to help to share more about what others in the merchant acquiring space are doing. And um, for that, we've got three great panelists, um, Anthony Jenkins from Payrock, John Shipley from Clarent, and Frank Pagano from BusyPay, um, three companies that have experience with, I think, both cash discounting and surcharging, and we'll, we'll unpack that a bit in today's conversation. Uh, to, to jump in and kick off, I think, let's do a quick just round of intros, um, and we'll start with, with Anthony. If you could just mind introducing yourself and your yeah. company and your role, and then... Yeah, sure. We'll come in later, the second round of questions, we'll talk about cash discounting and surcharging. charting, but let's just start with kind of the, the company and who you guys are. Yeah, sure, sure. So my name is Anthony Jenkins. Uh, I've been a certified payment professional and director of sales for Payrock for about nine years now. Uh, so my role is to pretty much, uh, you know, go out there and uh, recruit new agents, uh, educate them on the industry, get them trained, uh, get them out there, uh, being successful, um, and a lot has to do with with uh, surcharging. I mean, obviously, that's the, this is the new wave, so it's a big part of that. Uh, but also, I'm still out there. I'm still out there in the trenches, uh, still writing deals, still working relationships, shaking hands, uh, and that has a big deal with with surcharging as well. So, it's uh, it's really an honor to be on this panel with you guys. I don't see a lot of um, sales agents on panels. It's a lot of you know CEOs. It's a lot of uh, VPs and stuff. So just the fact that I'm here uh, having a discussion with you guys, I'm really, really blessed and honored. So thank you very much. And, and Derek, I don't know how you found three bald guys. <laughs> this is the, whole, the whole reason we're not doing this in person is in case it's gonna, contagious. I don't, so. I don't know how you pulled this off with great hair and three bald guys, but well played there. Well played. All good. Yes. Awesome. Um, thanks, Anthony, and welcome. It, why don't I actually, before we move on, do you mind just giving the quick elevator pitch on Payrock? Because I think you guys yeah, have an yeah, interesting absolutely. corporate history. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So Payrock was founded in 2003. Um, actually, three of my great friends uh, started the company um, just going out there, just going out there and pounding the pavement and, and meeting business owners and signing accounts. And uh, they did that for a long time. And, you know, they hired on a couple people here and there. But then uh, we had a great uh, CEO, James Overman, came over took us under the wing, brought us to a new level. Uh, we started inquiring other companies. Um, great, and, and I transact out of Utah. Uh, we inquired integrity um, that just brought more, more things to the table that we just couldn't do it at the time. And then we had this just recent merge um, with three amazing companies, Payscape, um, Next Gen and uh, Blue Pay Canada that made us international. So right now, I mean, we're, we're processing about 23 billion uh, a year. Um, and in 17 years, we're able to do that. I think we're top 10 of non-bank acquired processing companies. So uh, it's, it's a beautiful thing to see. And, and obviously surcharging is a main part of this revenue that's going to come storming through. So, so yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks, Anthony, and, and yeah, welcome. Uh, absolutely. Thank looking you. Looking to your perspective from the front lines and hear more about the Payrock approach. So, um, let's jump next to, to John Shipley from Clarent, uh, another company that's that's growing through M&A as well. But, uh, John, if you mind introducing yourself and your role in, in kind of a Clarent elevator pitch. Sure, not a problem. And Derek, thanks for having me join the panel for the, this, this discussion as well. Uh, my name is John Shipley. I'm the Senior Vice President of Third Party Relationships at Clarent. Um, I've been with, in the industry for about 28 years now. Uh, I've had the benefit of working at a variety of organizations from national large players like National Processing Company, as well as BA Merchant Services, uh, as well as ISO shops like Financial Alliance and Payment Alliance International. Uh, and I came to join Clearant uh, in 2017 uh, through an acquisition of a portfolio from the Payment Alliance International Group. Um, Clearant, just the history, they've been around since 2005. Organization started by a gentleman by the name of Dan Garrity uh, and a few investors uh, with the concept of wanting to create their own payment processing platform uh, that eventually evolved into not only a clearing and settlement system, but they now also have, we have our own uh, proprietary gateway solution that we call Quest uh, that we market out in the marketplace. Clearance philosophy early on was transparent payment processing, being upfront with the merchants about fee structures and costs, uh, no hidden uh, agendas or things of that nature, prior to providing quality service. We wanted to have diverse uh, sales distribution channels available to offer our products and solutions. Uh, we've continued to evolve uh, 
Back in 2018, we started going into what we call uh, the SaaS model, where we were acquiring into market verticals that made sense. Um, we're not trying to be all things to all merchants and all industries, uh, but we want to make sure that we specialize uh, so we can take the best benefit of the support infrastructure that goes along with you know, specializing in a particular vertical. Excellent. Thanks, Chip, and welcome. Excited to have you here. Uh, and, and finally, the, the third panelist we've got is uh, Frank Pagano from VisiPay, uh, a newer company, but love to, to maybe have Frank, if you don't mind giving the introduction on yourself and, and VisiPay. Sure. Well, I appreciate it, Derek. Uh, thanks for having me. So, um, VisiPay, uh, I'm, I'm one of the executive sales directors here with VisiPay. Uh, my duties oversee the uh, kind of the sales uh, division within the company, which is, you know, our inside sales channel, our uh, reseller channel and then our agent partner channel. Um, so I do kind of the day-to-day -day oversight of that. Um, and uh, the company was founded in 2017. So we are kind of the newcomer, the new kid on the block. Um, and as you um, can uh, you know, remember back to 2017, that was kind of really when cash discounting surcharging began to gain steam. And so we really have built the company around the uh, cash discounting and surcharging models uh, and I would say that, um, you know, even though we're a relative newcomer, especially to, you know, some of the folks, even on the panel, uh, and definitely within the industry, uh, when it comes to knowledge and, and um, resources around these two programs, I would say that we can hold our own, you know, um, with, with anyone. So, um, you know, the, uh, the programs have been instrumental in our growth. Um, you know, we, uh, we continue to see uh, double digit and even triple digit growth year over year. And, um, you know, are um, pleased to be here and, and uh, you know, welcome the opportunity to talk more about kind of our solutions and how we do things. Excellent. Thanks, Frank. And we'll, we'll actually yeah. start with you um, for this first question. But could you walk us through kind of, you know, there's a lot of different flavors of cash discounting and surcharging programs. There's a lot of a nuance I think we want to tease out in this conversation. Do you mind just summarizing kind of the, the flavors of programs you offer today and, and, and how that's sure. evolved over time and where you see it headed? Well, again, so back to 2017, um, the marketplace was a little bit different than it is today. Um, you know, I would hesitate to call it the Wild West, but, you know, there was kind of that feeling of everybody kind of saw this new program and it was kind of something that was interesting and people could talk about. Um, that wasn't interchange, that wasn't erased to zero. It was good for the merchant, it was good for the, you know, the ISOs, it was good for the agents, I mean, it's good for everybody. And so, you know, um, the, the program as it was in 2017 is far different than it is today in 2020. So, you know, there was a lot of confusion back then of what is a cash discount? There was all kinds of, you know, talks about, you know, is it a surcharge? It looks like a surcharge, but it's not a surcharge. How does it work? The Durban Amendment became kind of involved in that conversation. And so, um, you know, as, as kind of the popularity of the program, you know, picked up even more steam, there started to become guidance from, you know, Visa, uh, from acquirers, from sponsoring banks, where um, they wanted to see some delineation between surcharging and cash discounting. And so, you know, at about that time, um, we really kind of made a pivot. Uh, and kind of looked deep and hard about what is uh, a cash discount. Uh, surcharging is pretty defined. It's pretty easy to understand. You know, you have a, a debit card transaction is not going to be involved in a service fee, whereas a credit card transaction is going to be involved in a service fee. It's only available in certain states and so on. But cash discounting, um, we thought about it and said, well, what's wrong with just an actual cash discount? What's wrong with raising the price up? I mean, ultimately, the initial model that, that everybody was working with was a service charge at the counter of let's say 4%, where a $10 item through a service fee at the cash register becomes 1040. And we're saying, well, hey, let's work with these merchants and let's make the price 1040. So if you go into your favorite you know, deli um, and they have $10 sandwiches, let's make the sandwiches 1040. Let's just bite the bullet and assume that everybody's gonna pay with cash and let's truly give them a discount for cash. We've noticed that it hasn't really, you know, it hasn't driven more cash sales anytime we've done this. Um, you know, our way of doing things is a little bit different because it's, you know, it's a little bit more work on the front end, but we've developed some apps. Uh, we've got a proprietary Clover app, one in the PAX market as well, that's going to be, uh, I think, going live here within the next 30 to 60 days. But ultimately what we're doing is we're bringing inventory in. It automatically marks that inventory up by 4%. 
and then discounts an appropriate amount to offset that exact uh, price increase. So we're doing the exact same thing um, as the initial models. As far as the result is concerned, we're, you know, we're giving people um, that are paying with credit cards, it's going to be a little bit higher price than people that pay with cash. But we're doing it in a way that is fully compliant. We've been vetted through our acquirer, um, you know, through the, uh, through the card networks and uh, something that we can go home and sleep at night. Our agents can sleep at night. Our merchants are getting what they want. So we've had to do it. We've pivoted. And I'm not saying that we won't pivot again, but um, at this point, I think we're, we're pretty happy with where we are. And I think in private conversations, you refer to that as cash discount 2.0 is kind of the, the exactly. flavor you're going with. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll come back later and see what cash discount 3.0 okay. is going to be, but uh, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll let's move on to uh yeah, exactly. Uh, we'll move on to John Shipley from Clarence. I mean, it, it, mind kind of introducing your approach, uh, Ship, and, and how Clarence approaching surcharging and cash discount. Yeah, most definitely. And uh, and you know, we started in getting involved with the cash discount solution and programs in 2018. Um, you know, when it was picking up some significant momentum, kind of to Frank's point, um, we initially went out with the service fee approach. Um, and then around October of that year, you know, Visa sent out a clarification document on what the explanation or intention of the cash discount solution is supposed to be like. Uh, and they use the example of the petroleum space, which has had cash discounting available for over 15 to 20 years. Um, you know, a lot of people have seen it. You had a credit sign and you had a cash price sign. Uh, they wanted the distinctions to be available. So as we were, and, and at the time we only were offering cash discounting in 2018 with the service fee approach where you add the fee and then remove it at the register and you show it on the receipt. Um, so after the clarification uh, and, and, and to Frank's point, we do also continue to spend a lot of time working with the sponsor banks and the card brands to get a lot of consistent feedback because we want to make sure that we're a thought leader in how we're approaching our program. So heading from 2018 into 2019, uh, that's when we decided to not only offer and promote the cash discount solution, we added the surcharging component and we rebranded our product uh, by the name of Empower. Um, we use the philosophy that you know the, the merchant has the empowerment to determine what type of pricing model they want to implement for their consumer base. Um, we went and we talked about the, the requirements of the program and we wanted to make sure that we were in front of the messaging. We wanted to make sure that we gave the, the merchant the appropriate resources to market the different solutions, uh, making sure that there was uh, clear disclosures to the, the consumer so they knew and were aware what was available to them uh, from an acquisition or purchasing aspect. We didn't want to create an environment uh, where it, it stirred up negativity with the consumer base that either they didn't want you know, to pay the higher price or be penalized because they're using another form of payment you know, from a card standpoint. Um, so you know, we, we implemented those things in early 2019 and quickly we began to see that the, the revamp or the new approach to the program was even more gravitating to the, the, mer the merchants out there in the industry uh, because it gave them the control to pass through their cost of acceptance. Uh, they also had scenarios to where they could get creative with the type of cash discounting uh, promotions that they would offer to the consumers. Um, you know, we helped them with uh, labels and branding. We would work with them on messaging. Um, we wanted to make sure that everything was underneath clearing control and we had oversight. And then even as we continue to implement the program, working with our sales distribution channels, we continue to get additional feedback from working with the car brands directly uh, about things that are appropriate or things that are being misinterpreted uh, so we could continue to, to evolve the solution. Uh, I've started to see a trend for more Uh, as we get more technologies available uh, and as well as getting more resources uh, for some of the, the terminal types that we're supporting and sourcing. Thanks, Chip. Um, and Anthony, I'd love to get the Payrock perspective. I mean, does it look a lot like clearance or VisiPays or are you guys charting your own path? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, we have a couple different solutions that we're running out with. Well, you know, in 2016, 2017, when we, um, when we inquired um, I, or Integrity, they were the ones that brought this cash discount to us. We were actually didn't really know too much about it. And then all of a sudden it was like, holy cow, look at this. I mean, this is, 
you know, the, as a rep, you obviously you loved it. You're like, wow, five times residuals and you're saving these, you know, companies all this money. But, uh, you know, what we, we were doing, it was when we were surcharging everything, we were surcharging debit, we were surcharging credit cards, um, you know, three and a half percent, four percent. I think I don't think we've ever went over four, but it was around three and a half, four percent. Well, then the card car brands came back to us and said, hey, we, you know, we you can't do it this way. Um, so that's when, when our CEO got in the lab, uh, and he decided, okay, what, what are we going to do? We got to be compliant. We got to do this the right way. Um, we were, we were told that, you know, that ISOs would be penalized, uh, sales groups would be penalized for, for doing it the wrong way, the non-compliant way. Right. So, um, we, we changed up our model and we came out with a couple different, um, uh, surcharging programs. And one is, uh, what we like to call reward pay. And basically what that is, is it's, like a like a, a cash discount 2.0 where it's it's now we're no longer surcharging on debit right um, we have the nice the signage you have to have the signage somewhere in the location whether it's you know brick and mortar on your website however you're taking your payments but um, we have the sign that says we're hey we're gonna surcharge uh, you know three and a half percent on credit but save money by paying with cash or debit so that was you know that's one of the that's a, that's our big seller that that is probably what we sell, 90% of the deals that come through here right now are a reward pay deal. Um, now we also have another program um, called Cash Rewards. And that's basically kind of like what Frank talked about as well, having these clients raise their pricing, right? Ra let's raise the pricing 3%. Um, and then, but we have on their settlement technology on the back end, we're able to take that 3% out of daily settlements, sit it into like a, a non escrow bucket, if you will, right? Every day they batch out that 3% is going to sit there. And then at the end of the month, that bucket's going to pay their fees. So initially it's going to leave them with a zero balance on their statement. Um, so that is another program. Um, that some merchants love to do. Um, it, we see a lot with, they just, they're kind of scared about advertising, right? I'm sure you guys know a lot of those, the clients say, hey, we don't want to advertise. We don't have that sticker in our window that says we're going to surcharge. But when you're not looking at it so much as a surcharge, but as a savings, you know, anyone that has a credit card has a debit card. So when you educate, and it's, it's a purely about educational, you educate these clients on, um, hey, you ha you know this will if you're taking 30 percent debit and 70 percent credit cards i mean you're talking significant savings right that we can that we can offer you so our reward pay model is strictly getting away from charging or uh, surcharging on the debit but strictly on the credit cards itself uh and and our, and our clients are loving it they're uh, really loving it i don't think i think we maybe had one or two that switch from surcharging back to interchange plus right so those are our main two that we're working but yeah very similar to them uh, but just making sure we're compliant that's that's the main focus here making sure we're playing by the rules and doing it the right way and so it sounds like your your best selling is is that reward pay program and that's that's basically kind of payrock's version of a surcharge program kind of yeah absolutely about the surcharge right yep absolutely so what and, and you've got the i mean let's talk about the, the kind of frontline approach of working with merchants i mean when you're trying to yep. introduce this program to them what, how are you pitching it? How are you framing it? What are the, the value propositions you're, you're tying Yeah, so, so are you asking me? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, great, yeah, all right. Um, so, yeah, so I, I mean, I, I really approach it and even um, our junior sales professionals that we're training, we're really training them to lead with reward pay, with a surcharge program. I feel Interchange Plus is, on its way out. I mean, yes, you're going to have it there and you're going to have merchants that are going to, they're going to want to, they're just going to want to keep doing it. But for the most part, I really feel the surcharge is where it's going to go, where our payment industry is going to go when these businesses see the savings that they're showing them. So when we approach, when I approach a business, generally what we like to do, like a lot of people, we get their merchant statement, right? Let's see what type of cards you're taking in. Uh, let's see how much debit you're taking in. And we do these thorough cost analysis. Um, and, and, we, and I bring them and I bring them proposals. I really do. And I, I bring them, hey, this is what we can do if we can lower you down on Interchange Plus. And you know, you're at 40 bips, it's the race to zero, right? So now we can take you from 40 to 20. This is what we can save you. Uh, but when I show a, a client, the savings that they can see with reward pay. Um, you know, I'm not the guy, I don't want to be the guy that comes in here and saves you 20 bucks, 40 bucks, a hundred bucks a month. You have tons of those guys that come through here. You get those calls nonstop. I want to be the guy that comes in here, gives you a great program that you don't have to worry about this anymore. You, you, you know, you lock in with the surcharge program. You're going to see, you're going to see the fruits of it and you're not married to it. 
You know, that's, that's a big thing with, with merchants that I see. I mean, obviously I'm talking about the Midwest. That's where I'm selling. But what I see is a lot of businesses being afraid of, Oh, you know, the, the cost, Oh, they're not going to like it. They're not going to like it. Well, you don't have to be married to it is, you know, we will, and we do nice things. We package things in where we'll do a free terminal. Hey, let's, let's get you set up for two months and try it out. If you're getting complaints nonstop from customers, we'll put you back to interchange plus. Um, so you just kind of feel them out and, you know, but I, I really think that when, you know, you don't want to sell just strictly on savings, right? You want to have that support that we have. Um, you're calling uh, um, our number right to our office. You're not calling some number and you're getting to talk to someone who, you know, you're on hold forever. So the customer su supports a huge part of it. But, you know, when you're showing someone you're going to save them twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year, it's really hard for them to say, mm, yeah, I don't know if I want to do it. Right. So I mean, that, that's really our tactics here is that we lead with the surcharge. We let them know that this is the way it's moving and some, and let them know, Hey, there's businesses on your block that are probably doing this, but they might just be doing it a different way. They might be hiding it. They might be raising their prices a little bit and doing it the other way. Right. So that's, that's really how, how we do it. But that's, and we really go after educating them, educating the merchant, letting them know it's a hundred percent compliant. Because I'm sure you guys know, uh, Frank, you know, John, you know that you'll have the merchants that um, uh, I don't know if this is if this is this legal, right? Is this legal? Right. So, you know, we let them know that this everything is compliant from the card brands uh, and we're doing it the right way. Um, and I mean, I tell you the truth, like I said, 90 percent of the deals we're writing are strictly surcharge programs. I mean, I really feel like this is where it's going to. Yeah, I feel inter surcharge now is like interchange plus was to tiered pricing. Remember tiered pricing? So when yeah. tiered pricing went from that to interchange, all the savings you were offering clients during that time, I feel like this is that new wave. This is that new wave of now look at these surcharging. You business owners don't have to pay these fees anymore. And I, I think they're starting to get it. Sounds like a, a compelling value prop. I mean, Ship, do you guys have similar kind of apprehension among merchants that, you know, they, they see the savings, but they're nervous about the customer impact? Is that... Is that a real concern early, and how do you guys navigate it? Actually, it is a real concern early on in the game. Um, I think over the last year, we've seen the merchant mentality kind of morph because their, their neighbor down the street, you know, or their, their, their next door businesses are already offering it. So they're talking amongst each other. They're trying to hear feedback. What are you hearing from your consumer versus your other consumer? And, and one of the, the analogies that we use with our sales teams is this. Everybody's being, as a consumer, if you ever go to a standalone ATM and you try to withdraw cash, what's that question that's going to ask you at the end? Or do you want to pay a surcharge fee of three ninety five, two seventy five, or whatever? And if you say no, you won't get cash. <laughs> but, you know, everybody's accustomed to saying yes. So the consumer is already conditioned to pay a surcharge fee. And, and to, to Anthony's point, as it relates to going from tiered pricing to interchange plus to now uh, the surcharging, think of it from this perspective. The merchant population is much more knowledgeable in this day and age about interchange than what they were 10 to 15 years ago when they were paying tiered rates. So because of that increase in knowledge, they're aware of what they talk about when they say processing costs or cost of acceptance. They see that on their statements each month. So when you go in from a consultative sales approach, and that's kind of what we teach our sales channels, come in and consult with the merchant and the, the business owner because they're, they're having to manage their expenses because they're trying to increase their revenue in a, in a market and conditions that even pre-COVID were so much competition between online, e-commerce, and, and trying to maintain foot traffic in your establishments. You have to differentiate yourself. And as a small business owner, you know, that's a, a even more larger burden because you have to run the business and still manage, you know, your employees and your staffing and things of that nature. So if you give them one less expense to be concerned with in your pitch, then they're, they're open minded to it. Now, on the flip side of that, we also give testimonials. You know, we uh, even in our marketing materials and in our sales programs, we provide testimonials of customers who were initially skeptics of the program or the solution that have seen the benefits of it thereafter. Um, you know, and, and again, in, as percentages run, you're going to have a handful of consumers that are going to object. 
And that's why you create the feature functionality within your solutions to where you could bypass uh, a surcharge on a per transaction basis. You know, you let the, the, the business owner and their staff know that if you have somebody that's objecting, go ahead and address that need up front. Don't let that fester with the consumer and you might lose some repeat business. Go ahead and, and take care of that consumer at that time. But for the general population, a good majority of them are gonna be okay. Uh, we're getting more conditioned to it. You know, in 2018, you might have ran into every third merchant that had the program, but here in 2019 and 2020, you know, that's increased. Um, you have more and more solutions becoming available. Um, you know, and again, to, to Anthony's point, surcharging is becoming more and more prevalent uh, so we want to make sure that we continue to re-educate not only our sales force, but we also re-educate from a clear perspective, uh, our staff, our operational areas and things of that nature. So that way at every touch point in our organization, everybody's layered up with being able to speak positively about the Empower program and the advantages to the consumer and the merchant. So it sounds like there's, there's kind of some pre, you know, nowadays versus a couple of years ago, there's much more awareness and interest on the part of merchants for these programs and an openness that may not, may not have existed a couple of years ago when it was new. Definitely. Got it. Um, Frank, how about a curious, you know, of the merchants you enroll in your cash discount program, you know, do they all stick with it? And is there any theme for the ones that, you know, tend to, to stick with it and be satisfied versus others that end up, you know, whether it's switching to a traditional processing product or... You know, with the 2.0 version, we just don't see a lot of kind of transfer back and forth from one program to the next. Um, kind of the, the simple thought here, uh, and by the way, we have a motto, simple pricing, simple decisions. And, you know, I would say that almost every time we would lead with cash discounting as the main kind of driver for the program offering, uh, because it applies to everybody. We can do a simple price increase and we can decrease for, for cash. And that could be you know, uh, the, uh, the deli example I gave, that could be the swimming pool, um, you know, service company that is quoting $520 uh, and then, you know, re removing $20 for, uh, for cash or a check payment. Um, so, I mean, it applies to anybody. And so because we don't have that pushback, um, that kind of, that user experience um, where it's maybe a, a friction point, which you know, by the way, the 1.0 version and our hybrid model, which is our surcharging model, we do see that. Uh, we do see, and it, it doesn't happen a lot. It's, it's a lot less than every merchant would probably think. You know, they think that it's going to be a line of people, you know, turning around at the cash register and running for, you know, for the door. It doesn't happen that way, but it is something that does sometimes happen. And, you know, unfortunately, when that happens day one, uh, even with the proper education, even with the proper signage, even doing it exactly, you know, in a compliant manner, um, people get cold feet. They lose a customer, you know, transaction number two. Um, a lot of times they want to switch to a different kind of uh, a different program. So uh, from our 2.0 version, we don't see it because quite honestly, the, the uh, user experience is different. Um, you know, that person that's uh, the consumer experience is, is a lot more positive. So you're not gonna get upset if your price of your roast beef sandwich goes from 1040 to $10. And you know, it really, it's never really a dollar and cents type of, uh, of um, frustration. It's just the principle of it. And if you've read any, you know, uh, people's um, reviews or complaints or that type of thing, whether it's a Facebook chat or something like that, when it comes to uh, a surcharge or, you know, a uh, service fee or whatever you have, uh, it never really is about the extra dollar that somebody had to pay. It almost always seems to revolve around the principle of the idea. So raise the price up a buck. Don't charge me a dollar for using my card. And so we heard that enough times initially that we just didn't want to fight that fight anymore. Uh, if someone wants to go say that our cash discount program is not a fit, whether they, you know, maybe it's a high skew. Uh, so if you think about the way that we do it, we're talking to people, raise your price up. Well, if it's a convenience store and they have 10,000 SKUs, it's not a good fit. We would not lead with cash discounting in that scenario. We would look at that and say, hey, we can do this, but you know, maybe you'd be a better candidate for our hybrid or surcharging model where we're tacking on you know, a fee at the register, or maybe it's an interchange plus type of uh, scenario. So um, I think just the way that our program is designed, it kind of, um, it kind of eliminates that, that uh, rev point, if you will. Got it. 
and, and Anthony, you're, you guys are doing a lot of surcharging, um, which, you know, as we've discussed a little bit, the debit and because uh, of the Durban Amendment, you know, surcharge can only apply to a credit card, can't apply to a debit card, um, regardless of how that debit card is routed. Um, I'd love to get your feedback. Do, do you see a mix shift in terms of more consumers paying with debit card at, at surcharge enabled merchants or do the customers stay with credit and just pay the surcharge? Well, to be, to be honest, no. Um, and I know it'd be surprising, you know, um, but no, we really haven't. Um, because I, I mean, I, I truly believe that like as a consumer, when I go out to dinner with my family, I know what I'm going to pay with. I already know what I'm going to pay with. And I think of that, right, that does generate a lot with, with, with consumers is when they go out and do something, Hey, I already know I want my points, man. It's about rewards. It is about reward points. So if you're going to, if I go out to dinner with my family for a hundred dollars and you're going to charge me another $3 to use my rewards card that I'm going to get points for, for free flights, I, I don't, I don't mind. Right. I don't care. I just, I don't. And I really think that it, it's, it's coming to that where it's just, I think consumers like, like Frank was saying, like, it's just, they don't, they don't really care. They really don't. Um, and this is not even just mom and pop places that we've are surcharging. I mean, it's not just your, you know, your Italian beef stores. It's, it's, econ uh, it's logistic companies. It's at the airport, right? It's at um, venues like, uh, you know, venue places are surcharging. So, I mean, this place, it's pretty much everywhere. So I just, I don't think that people are starting to turn away and use debit more. I'm sure you're going to have, I'm sure you're going to have those. Like my clients will call and say, Hey, I've had a couple complaints, but you're giving them that option. This is a, this is an option product. You don't have to eat that surcharge. You can pull out your debit card. Everyone that has a credit card has a debit card. Um, but for the most point, I, I really think that, um, you know, consumers want those rewards. They want the rewards. And I really think that's what drives this because business owners are starting to understand when they get educated that, I don't want to pay for your rewards anymore, right? I, if, you, if you want your rewards, then you're going to pay for your rewards. And um, I really think, you know, where, where I'm selling, and, you know, in the Midwest right here in Chicago and in Indiana and, and around here. Um, but uh, I, I really think that, no, I, I, we're not really seeing a lot of change going back to debit. I just think that consumers know, hey, this is what it is. Um, and, and, and they're going with it. So. So is the, the, the fact that you brand your surcharging as reward pay, is that, is that the idea that you make a cardholder pay for the rewards or? Well, no, a reward pay would be, I mean, like if, if you're, if you don't, yeah, so it would be cheaper, right? If you want to save yeah. money yeah. and use your debit card, right? Yeah. Your reward would be right there. So if you don't want the surcharge, uh, debit or, or cash, right? Yeah. Um, which, which is great for, for your, your clients who, you know, obviously, 95% is cash, maybe 90% is, or 90% is credit that's coming in. So if this does bring a little bit more cash flow in, that's great. Um, which even if they go debit, that's cheaper for them on the fees side. So they're not paying all these crazy high fees for these corporate cards and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, but the reward would be to, if you want to pay debit in cash, that's your reward there. You're not getting that surcharge. Got it. Um, and Ship, would love to to get your perspective. Do you find that there's some merchants these programs are better for, and others where you look to steer clear? Like, is there like tip based merchants? Are they just as eligible, or is it geographic? Or and actually, that's a good question, Derek, because I was thinking about this. One of the things that we ran into because of the verticals that we started to attack was that um, the average ticket size was playing a factor into some of the surcharging. Uh, clients. So we had to find a sweet spot of if it was above a certain type of average ticket, then we didn't promote or pitch the surcharging solution, uh, you know, because we have field services companies that are doing contract bids and things of that nature. So that average ticket could get up there quite a bit. Uh, so it wasn't exactly a, a, you know, a nice fit. If you've got a merchant that has a very small average ticket, you know, there's certain ways to approach their cost of acceptance that, you know, might not bring them the type of benefit that they're looking for. So when we first rolled out, you know, because you could either do a per item uh, cash discounting or surcharging, or you could do it based on a percentage point. Um, so uh, we looked at that based on the business model, average ticket of the merchant, and what made sense. It is available to restaurants, you know, with tip uh, functionality as well. So we promote that heavily. Um, you know, we want to make sure we put the right software solutions in place that can accommodate uh, cash discounting with tips. Um, so we had to work and search to, to do that type of situation and scenario, but we want to make sure that we're not creating additional friction 
between the merchant and the consumer by setting somebody up for the program for it ultimately to be a detriment uh, to, to what they're doing in their business model. So again, with us trying to use the consultative sales approach, we want to make sure that we're giving them good guidance. Uh, we want to give them the solid story and scoop and making sure that, they're, that we're following through on our commitments to them as our partner. Thanks, Chip. Um, so we've got a couple questions that have been submitted already. So I'll go ahead and start asking uh, some of those. And for anyone in the audience, if you have questions you'd love for us to ask these panelists, uh, feel free to use the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen uh, to send those through. Um, so this first one, I'll, I'll toss to Frank first, um, but then give, give Chip and Anthony a chance to jump in if you want. Um, do you think cash discounting will stay relevant in this environment post pandemic where consumers are looking to shift away from cash? Well, yeah, I mean, so that's a great question. Um, I think the shift away from cash started long before COVID. Um, I don't think that, that, um, for the most part, people carry cash. I mean, some people, um, I, I think it's maybe the younger generation is, is less apt to carry cash. Um, you know, we didn't necessarily uh, create these programs as an industry to drive more cash business. Um, we're kind of calling the bluff, if you will, that says, yeah, hey, we'll save you 4% or 3% if you pay with cash. And you know what, it's great for the owner or the merchants if they do pay with cash because, you know, the cost is not there. Um, but what we've seen is uh, when we've implemented, especially back in the day when we had an interchange account, uh, and there's a big account that I'm thinking of that did, um, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars a month. They were an interchange plus merchant. Um, and we tracked. We had them for, you know, a good eight months before we kind of transitioned them into a cash discount program. And uh, we didn't see not a dollar of difference month over month, you know, year over year uh, numbers. We didn't drive any more cash business. Um, <clears throat> so I've, I anticipate that we'll see the same trend that even though the, the, I think the relevance of the program is probably more relevant now than it ever has been, just in the sense that uh, I think more, uh, more merchants are gonna be open to the idea of this because every dollar matters. When times were good, hey, I don't need the, you know, seven, $800 a month, I don't need it that bad, uh, where maybe their tune might have changed a little bit now and they'd be more open to it. So, you know, I guess to, to kind of recap, I don't think that we're gonna have more cash transactions as a result. I don't think that's gonna all of a sudden be the case. And I do believe that it will be relevant um, into the future and, and probably to echo what uh, others on the panel have said that I do think this is gonna be kind of the next iteration of the tiered versus interchange. I think it's gonna go interchange to surcharging cash discounting being pretty heavy. And, and Chip or Anthony, I mean, how do you guys think COVID changes the game around surcharging and cash discounting. Does it delay it? Does it accelerate it? I, it... I think, uh, I'm sorry to cut you off, John. I don't know if you were going to say something, but yeah. Uh, I, uh, no, I think, I think it drives it. I drive these business owners need it. This is the time these people have been, had their doors closed and they've been paying these lease payments and they're trying to get by however they can. Now is the time to come to these merchants and let them know, you know, um, you know, we were, we've been setting businesses up with, um, online ordering through a website 999 that we came out with um, that helps them. Uh, their clients can order food right there on the website and they can do a surcharge. Um, and instead of paying the 30% from Grubhub, they're only paying 5%. I mean, we rolled out a, a survival guide to our clients to help them. Uh, and surcharging was a main, a big thing ab about it. And I just think now is the time that these clients need our help. They need search or they need to save that money. Like Frank said, they might have not cared about the $700 a month savings before, but they sure do now, right? So they lost a lot of employees. Employees maybe had to go somewhere else. But so, no, I think I think COVID actually drives surcharging. And I think a lot of business owners now are going to open their ears more and say, okay, let me, let me hear about this, you know, before maybe they uh, wasn't ready or they just didn't like doing it. But I think now with COVID saying, okay, man, that, that's $700 a month or that, that you know, that $30,000 a year, could I could really use that. So no, I, I really think COVID is going to drive this more. Yeah, I actually, I agree with Anthony and as well as Frank. I mean, this is a driving force now to where merchants and consumer, you know, customers are, of ours are asking, you know, for ways to help them with, you know, sustain business and survive. Um, so if anything, this has increased the, the interest in what's available to them. And, and also to, to, to Anthony's point, we've had quite a few that wanted to sit back and wait 
to see what it was about or get more information or doing research pre-COVID. And then once COVID hit, those same merchants are now following up with our sales reps, asking, you know, how can you get me going? How quickly can you get me set up? Um, you know, what, are, what, the, what else is available to me to, to help mitigate some of my uh, costs of processing or my expenses? Got it. Um, so next question comes from uh, Donald Esposito. And, and again, I, I'll toss this one to Frank first. It's how do these cash discounting programs comply with the visa bulletin from October of 2018 that said, you know, models that encourage merchants to add a fee on top of the normal price of the items being purchased, then give an immediate discount of that fee at the register if the customer pays with cash or debit card are not compliant. Um, um, so it's, yeah, I'm sure many people are familiar with the visa bulletin in October, 2018, but any thoughts on how your program complies? Yeah. So mine, um, you know, with, with visa, uh, guidance in mind, um, you know, the program itself is the price that the consumer sees is the price they pay. So it's a very simple concept. Now it also includes a price increase of 4%, but that is fully within guidance and uh, compliance within the you know, a merchant quite honestly can raise it where, wherever they want. You know, if they can be competitive with a 20% price increase, they're able to do what they want to do with their pricing. But with our program specifically, we work with them to raise their prices. So when I say work with them, you know, if it's that, that hypothetical deli, uh, we might print them new menus or get involved and give them some sort of a budget or an allowance to help them offset the cost of menu changes. Uh, so we're getting ahead of it and we're incorporating it into the price. And ultimately the way that we sell it is, hey, you know, Mr. Merchant or Mrs. Merchant, um, are people gonna use more or less credit cards? You know, let's get ahead of the cost, right? Let this not be a line item on your p &L. We can make it a simple, you know, one, uh, one flat fee per month. The, you know, the price increase, we can isolate and remove from the actual transaction, leaving you with the full amount that you want today. Um, so, when it comes to compliance, uh, our way of doing cash discounting is 100% compliant. Got it. Um, so we've had a handful of questions come through asking about card flights approach to all this. So you know, our, our main goal here was actually to bring together three you know, leading merchant acquirers and ISOs and have them share their experiences. But I'll, I'll maybe I'll field this quickly just for, for those that have asked. So one question was to swipe simple support cash discount. Um, so our, our general approach to this has been to support our resellers, the merchant acquirers and ISOs and how they want to structure their programs. So uh, we have recently rolled out an optional feature that we call automatic adjustments that can become a part of a resellers program. Uh, it's currently available on Swipe Simple Terminal, It'll be available in a few months on the, the mobile uh, and gateway product as well. So. Um, if you are a card flight reseller, talk to your account manager because there's a few requirements that you've got to comply with to, to be able to offer it. Um, it's on an opt-in basis. So uh, if you're not a reseller, you know, feel free to reach out to our sales team as well. So um, we aren't offering a cash discount program ourselves, but we're offering some tools that are intended to, to allow Swipe Simple to be a part of a, a merchant acquirer ISO's cash discount program that are recently rolled out. And that's a, a relatively new new thing for us. And then um, surcharging is on the roadmap as well, um, something we're intending to offer. Um, it'll be available first on the terminal product um, and then hopefully eventually on, on the rest of our suite as well. So um, that's on the roadmap uh, at this point, but something that we'll, we'll be adding in the future. So um, with that, I'm going to jump back to our panelists um, and, and continue to try to pull their knowledge out for everyone. Um, so one anonymous attendee asked, you know, how do each of you address merchants for cash discounting when their average ticket is, say, $500? Do you just avoid approaching them with cash discounting altogether, or do you stick with traditional processing? To be, to be honest, um, $500 average ticket, um, you know, that's, that's tough. That's tough. That's a tough sell. Yeah. Uh, it is. It's a tough sell. So, I mean, obviously, you're charging 3%, 3.5% of that. That's a big increase. So, uh, when, when it comes to a large average ticket, I usually approach it where, you know, listen, you can either you stand by your product right? You stand by your product and, and people do business with you because of your product and, and your service. So um, if you can, if you feel like you can, you can pull that off and you're not going to upset your customers because back what John was saying before, we never want to put you in a program that's going to upset your business. That's going to hurt your business. So that's a great question. And uh, you know, that, that's really, that's really tough. I do have, I do, we know we do have clients that our average tickets are a thousand dollars and they're doing a surcharge. So I just think you kind of, you almost put that back on to the customer 
right? And just say, hey, I mean, you know your, you know your clients better than I do. Um, if you feel like this is going to really upset them, um, then we don't have to do it. Um, but then again, it always goes back to you, you don't have to be married to it. If you throw a couple of these out here and things are working, hey, I don't mind paying an extra 30 bucks or whatever it is here, you know, or, or $15. So I don't, it's 500 bucks. I don't mind paying another 15. Um, and if you, and everything's going well, great. If you're getting a lot of complaints, we can always go back to interchange plus, right? You know, you're not married to it. So it's a great question, but that's, that's tough. You usually just gotta, you know, you gotta work with that, with that business owner and find out, you know, he knows his customers better than, than us. So great question though. Thanks, Anthony. Um, question here uh, from anonymous attendee was, have any of the three panelists known of any merchants fined by the card brands for not doing cash discounting or surcharging in a compliant way? And I'm how not high have the penalties been? I'm not sure if you're <laughs> it would be yeah. that specific, but what's well, been yeah. your landscape on the compliance side of things? I'm not, I'm not aware of any merchants being fined. And, and one of the things that in working closely with the card brands that you have to do is you have to make sure that if you're getting ahead of the complaint, Meaning from the time that you're notified through your sponsoring bank that there is a consumer complaint, you have about 30 to 60 days to mitigate that complaint. So you work with the sales distribution channel and the merchant, because most often what you will find is either there's an educational problem to where they didn't understand how to appropriately uh, administer the surcharging program or the cash discounting program, or you might find where they've inadvertently uh, surcharged the debit card. Um, so again, it's an educational type of thing. So our job is to protect the merchant. So part of our responsibility is to work with the compliance complaint and get it resolved and get it mitigated. Uh, and, if, and if the merchant, the way we operate, if the merchant comes upon two complaints, then we basically move them out of the surcharging program and we work with them to implement what we call our version of the true cash discounting program. Um, so that way uh, they can avoid uh, being under the scrutiny of the card brands. But I'm not aware of any fines that being levied by the card brands, uh, as well as, you know, they got to have a larger policing agent to be able to cover the entire industry. And I don't know that they've done any massive hiring here recently to police that many merchants uh, out there in our, in our base. Um, and, and one camp here, I don't know if there's a question or comment was kind of related to merchant signage and that potentially being a problem. Is that, do you guys find that signage is a, a core part of keeping complaints low and, and kind of ensuring compliance? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, Frank, go ahead. I was going to say definitely on the surcharging side, uh, for us, we, you know, we have signage that, um, you know, dictates or spells out exactly what, um, you know, what's going to happen on a credit transaction versus a, a cash or a, a debit transaction. Um, so, you know, the signage is, is key and it's mandatory for, uh, for that program. Uh, on the cash discounting side, you know, um, we do provide signage. It's a little less specific. It really is more, um, you know, the, the merchant does provide a cash discount or discount for cash if you, you know, choose to use that. We don't necessarily call out percentages on that. Um, we, we leave it a little bit more vague because quite honestly, if the merchant decides at some point the way that we do it, if they don't want to give a cash discount or they want to move away from the program altogether, um, they don't need a sign. They don't need to do anything. They can remove the sign or remove the discount. So Anthony, here's one for you, just being closer to the front lines. It's uh, how do agents make residuals on debit card charges? Well, in the surcharge program? Yeah. Yeah, I so I mean, well, I mean, unfortunately, the debt, you know, you, what we usually do is we go through and we look how much debit they're doing a month, right? I mean, if we want to be accurate, that's what we got to do. So, um, you know, it's usually we're fi signing someone up at maybe 25 basis points, maybe 50 basis points is what we're showing them on debit transactions. Um, it could be a little bit more. Obviously, if you're saving a ton of money on, um, on credit cards and they're doing a lot of their percentages on credit cards. So, you know, we just base that off of kind of how much savings we're showing them off of, you know, how much debit they're taking in. But, you know, usually it's anywhere from we're putting it merchants anywhere from 25 basis points, 50, 75, somewhere around there. So you still are making, um, you know, you're still making good, you know, residuals on debit. But uh, we just, you know, we're kind of going off of depends on the type of merchant and how much debit they're taking in. But that's usually roughly where we're at basis points wise with the debit. Got it. Um. Next one uh, from anonymous attendee. Uh, I'll 
throw this at you, Ship, to start is, are all the card brands, do they all have the same or similar policies around surcharging? And how do merchants make sure they're compliant with different requirements across the card brands? Actually, that's a very good question and one that's kind of recently come to bear um, because the card brands in general will follow the same guidelines and requirements for the most part. Um, you know, Visa and MasterCard seem to be the most in lockstep. Discover and Amex, you, when you get into those car brands, there's a slight, you know, there's some small amount of deviations. Um, case in point, um, with surcharging in the Amex rig, um, you know, Amex doesn't have what you would call a debit card product. Um, so, you know, even if you, you can surcharge on the credit card, they have no ulterior product to say you can't, like the Visa and MasterCard uh, has available. So I think that there will probably be some type of revision or some type of announcement from American Express coming probably in the next year uh, to talk about what their requirements are related to surcharging. And I think that that's when all of us on this panel will have to go back and revamp the way we're positioning that particular card brand, um, you know, with our surcharging programs. Uh, so you have to continue to, like I said, keep the dialogue open, uh, discussing th these type of items with the card brands so you can make sure that your programs remain uh, viable. Uh, it's they're always going to continue to morph, uh, but uh, but with the car brands, they've been watching what's been transpiring in the in the uh, industry, and they're, they're keeping a close eye on on how everybody's promoting the solutions, and they want to make sure that there's uh, fairness across all the brands about how the programs are being positioned. Excellent, thanks, Chip. Um, and and one final question for for each of you, and then we'll we'll go ahead and wrap. Um, so, you know, each of you seem to have very successful programs that are working really well for you today and, and you feel you've got your, your cash discounting and or surcharging programs pretty dialed in. Um, what predictions do you have, you know, looking out one to three years from now? Is it going to be more of the same? Do you think the market landscape is going to change? Uh, uh, I mean, I, I, Anthony, yeah. <laughs> that's like a buzzer. Bam! First one to respond. <laughs> uh, so... So no, I, I just, I, I mean, I really, you know, I, I've, been, I've said it a couple of times uh, during this panel is that I really think this is where it's moving to. It really is. I think one to three years from now, I think the more and more we start educating these merchants and doing it the right way, registering them with the car brands and doing it the compliance way, there's a lot of revenue to be made here. There's mm -hmm. a lot of revenue to be made for the, for the, for the, the companies, for the, the processors. There's a lot of savings, a lot of money that the, the merchants are saving. So I really think the more edge, the more we're out there, the you know, people do business with people. If yep. we go out there and we're educating and we're shaking hands and we're doing it the right way, I really think that this is moving. Surcharging is going to be the standard. Sorry about that. This is not my office. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but no, the surcharge, it will, this, this will, I really feel yeah. this will be the standard. I really think that this is, is going to keep moving and moving and, and we, you know, Interchange Plus will be the old tier. And I really think that this is the way that everything is going. I think, I think that's, it's only going to get bigger. I think it's only going to be more exposed. The more businesses understand it and accept it, everyone on the block, right? I don't want to be the first guy on the block. Well, in a couple of years, everyone on the block is going to be doing it. So I really think it's just going to keep driving and, and getting bigger. How about you, okay. Ship? What a, or go ahead, Frank. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I would agree with that. Um, and, you know, I think more so than just on the merchant side, I think uh, the adoption on that side is going to, you know, is whatever the industry is pushing out, I think ultimately there's going to be mass appeal and, you know, we'll get there just, uh, it may take some time, but I think what's going to make it easier for those merchants and for agents, quite honestly, to sell to those merchants is you're going to see technology start to um, kind of evolve to incorporate this. And, you know, uh, we started seeing some of the big players getting involved in cash discounting before that Visa Bulletin. Visa announces that they didn't like what was happening. Some of the big dogs back down. Uh, some of the, you know, some of the other big players kind of changed things up. And, you know, we started kind of all right, reassessing and kind of looking at where do we go from here. And I think we kind of have some clarity now. I think we understand where we are. And now you're going to start to see, and, you know, we've done it. I know Card Flight um, has done it with, you know, with adding tools to the toolkit uh, through technology. And I think what we're going to see is as more and more technology comes online, uh, we're solving other problems outside of savings. But it just makes it so much sweeter 
to be able to walk in and say, hey, I've got a new revolutionary software or platform that not only can you know, help the way that you're doing business and streamline the way that you're, that you're doing your business, but we can also save you a ton of money. So you know, I almost see it kind of as a, 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 um, a, a dance between technology and uh, savings that um, is going to be a lot easier pill to swallow than walking in with just a revolutionary platform to you know, to help manage your business. We're also gonna be able to show you how to pay for it and also maybe even beyond that, how to save money and, and add money to the bottom line. Makes so, sense. Yeah. Um, Ship, anything left in your crystal ball? Yeah, actually, uh, there's one other element that I would like to add to what Frank and Anthony has shared as well, is I think, yes, we've moved from cash discounting towards surcharging, but I also think we're going to start to see an uptick in the next layer of uh, convenience fees and service fees and, and things of that nature as well, uh, because, you know, with now certain industries and certain verticals, you know, during COVID and, and, and you know, and thereafter, they're now going into like uh, online ordering solutions or uh, delivery services or things of that nature. So there is a, a component of additional cost that they got to pass through. And that's to me seems to be where the next piece is going to be as well, which is service fees and convenience fees and things of that nature. Uh, if your type of business qualifies for it, but there's going to be a need for that. Um, you know, I, you know, my kids have been at home during COVID, so I constantly see Uber and 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 uh, uh, all the delivery services, Grubhub and Postmates and everything like that. Uh, and they all have, you know, I tell them, look at their receipt. There's a convenience fee or a service charge for that delivery. Um, so those are just another a wave of aspects of passing through these fees and charges. You know, if you've ever paid your utility bill online, there's a convenience fee that's charged for that. Um, so those type of things is going to continue to resonate because merchants need the ability to pass through some of their additional costs to the consumer. So this is going to continue to evolve. And, uh, and, and again, like, like I said, you know, everybody on the panel, we're going to seem to all stay involved with this and stay, uh, keep our pulse on the industry so we can make sure that we continue to grow our portfolios and help out our merchant business owners. Well put. Well, John Shipley from Clarent, Anthony Jenkins from Payrock, Frank Pagano from BusyPay. Thank you each for joining us today. And and sharing each of your perspectives on, on what you're doing in a space that clearly has a lot of interest uh, to, to many in the industry. So thanks to each of the thanks. three. Thanks for having Thank me. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, yeah. Derek. Thank you. And uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Jana to wrap us up and close it out. Great. Well, thank you again for participating in today's discussion. Uh, watch your email box for a recording or a link to the recording and um, share it with others if you found it um, informative. So you can track the progress of how small businesses are faring as states reopen across the country by following the Card Flight Biz Small Business Impact Report, which is available at our website. We will also send you a link to the latest report in the email in which we send you a link to this recording. So thank you again to Derek and to our panelists. And with that, we'll conclude the Zoom webinar. Thanks, everyone. All right, thanks. Thank you, guys. Thank you.